I had a mentor who was a very, uh, he was a pastor of a very, very large church, and he gave me his email address to get something set up, and I sent him an email, and I said, hey, let's get something set up, and I got an email back from his administrative assistant. I was supposed to meet with the president of our sending organization with World Gospel Mission. He invited me, actually, to sit down and talk about something, but to figure it out, I had to do that through the administrative assistant. You ever try to talk to somebody with power? It's hard sometimes, isn't it? People with power don't have enough time. They have to schedule their time, and they're hard to talk to because they're people. And they only have one mouth, and they only have so much time. God will listen to you will speak to you with no administrative assistant to schedule it, the most powerful conversation you can ever have with anyone does not need to be scheduled, planned, polished, or timed. Today's sermon, how to pray. And I just want to point out that we planned this specific sermon months ago And it's just so happened to be syncing up with two amazing things. One is this incredible refresh initiative. So just so happens that I'm preaching on how to pray when some of you just heard this thing about prayer on Wednesday night and you want to attend, but you might be thinking, been a while since I prayed. Not sure I, I... that was already planned. The second thing that's kind of amazing is, is what this specific testimony brought to us today was that there might be some here who have brought in something very, very heavy and you're not even sure how to talk about it, how to pray. There's some different ways to think about prayer. I want us to just quickly define prayer as dialogue with God. Maybe you already knew that. Maybe you didn't know that. It might depend on your background. I don't want to make any assumptions. Prayer is dialogue with God. I'm going to just kind of run through three different categories of things that you may have heard of before. So first of all, these are types of prayers. Adoration, thanksgiving, confession, intercession. Anybody heard of these types of prayers before? Yeah, quite most of us. But there's other types of prayers. These are less formal. There are written prayers. Sometimes there's a prayer that we write down and we read that prayer just the way that it is. There are silent prayers. So you don't even need to speak out loud. There's sometimes, uh, anybody ever been to a place and they say, let's have a moment of silence and you're a Christian so you don't say anything out loud with your mouth but you pray. That's a, a way of praying. There's uh, leadership prayers where you stand in front of people and maybe it's at the beginning or end of something and you lead them in prayer, but you're praying for uh, leaders. There's saying grace before a meal. That's a quick prayer. Lord bless this food to our bodies. There's pre-game prayers. (laughs) Why? Why? I didn't even make it that far into the sermon. I'm not talking about it. Good game. Uh... There's prayer for travel, traveling mercies. There's answered prayer, when something you've prayed for something and then it happens, then you thank God for answered prayer, et cetera, et cetera. There's also common voices in prayer. And I, as I wrote this, I thought, I wonder if they're gonna think that I'm making fun. I, I'm not. I'm just, I want us to be aware of all all the different things that are kind of coming into the room when we talk about prayer. And one of them is that we all kind of have a voice that we use in prayer. Like my grandpa never speaks with these and thous unless he prays. And he only prays in the King James. We have other people that sometimes when they pray, it's like a pep talk, tons of energy. I've heard some people that when they pray, they use Father God over and over and over. I don't know if that's a specific denomination where that happened. Father God, we just, then Father God, I Father God, a lot. There's tearful prayers. Some people, when they pray, they cry. There's big vocabulary prayers. 
I think I accidentally fall into that category. I say words in prayer that I don't say conversationally. They're super chill prayers. Lord, we're just thankful that you're here today and just super chill. How do you pray? What, what's your kind of your prayer voice? Have you ever thought about that before? When I pray, if it has to be out loud, I, I kind of sound like this, I guess. Some of us just don't feel qualified, maybe. So I don't pray out loud because I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. What are people going to think? Oh, they're gonna, there's some like real super prayer in the room and they're going to know I'm not a super prayer. The only requirement for prayer, this might surprise you. By the way, I don't think that I have ever heard a sermon on prayer like you're getting ready to hear today. The only requirement for prayer is sincerity. That's it. You don't need to know what to say. You don't need to follow any model. You can't say the wrong thing. You must only be sincere. We need nothing more than a sincere heart. So how should we view prayer, though? Because depending on how you were raised or what your awareness is of the church, you might have put prayer in this category. Some of us have prayer as a religious discipline. I need to pray. I forgot to pray today. I have to wake up and say my prayers. It's like a religious discipline. I'm not saying that it's not that, but it's not that. Some of us view it as a faith obligation. Like, I have to pray. If I don't pray, I must not have faith. Like, because I'm a person of faith and because I'm a Christian, I have to pray. Or else, that's not what it is either. Some of us view it as a Christian act. This is just something that, that Christians do. Good Christian people pray. Some of us view it as a method of attaining blank. Prayer changes things, which often means prayer gets me what I want. It's all of these, but it's none of these. All forms of prayer should be viewed through relational terms. Prayer is a dialogue. Prayer I'm just, I'm not oversimplifying. I'm just simplifying prayer is conversation. And so if the way that you're praying or understanding or thinking about it does not make sense in relationship, just cool it. You're talking to someone. It's just relation. It has to be relation. So what I'm gonna do, I've actually just made up five kinds of prayer. You're not going to find, like, these are not the five kinds of prayer. You're not going to find these in a book, I don't think. And there are five times five times five more than this because there are lots of ways to talk to people, right? How many different ways are there to interact with them? We have all kinds of different conversations. I'm having one with you right now. It's not much of a dialogue. You guys aren't saying much. I feel like I'm doing most of the talking here, but this is relational. I'm talking. So, Thank, hey, thanks for talking back. Now it's a dialogue. <laughs> All right, first one, secret prayer. Secret prayer. I'm going to root each one of these in Scripture just so you don't think I'm totally making these up out of thin air. Matthew 6, 6, Jesus is trying to explain prayer, and he doesn't like it really when people go and pray real loud and draw a lot of attention to themselves, so he explains secret prayer. He says, when you pray... Matthew 6, 6, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who can't be seen. He will reward you. Your father sees what is done secretly. We have secret conversations. The other night, Jade and I were closing up our day, and we were laying in bed. And I rolled over and I said, Jade, and I held her hand. I'm not going to tell you what I said to my <laughs> wife in bed. Are you kidding me? That was a secret conversation with my love. Are you with me? I had a conversation with someone I love, and I'm not telling you what I talked about. The dog. Probably. <laughs> probably the dog. Yes, often it's me looking at my wife and my wife petting the dog. I love this dog. <laughs> uh, let me give you a statement. I'm, I'm phrasing it this way so that you can write it down. 
I am what I do in secret. I am what I do in secret. When we love someone, we have secret interact. And it doesn't mean that I'm doing anything wrong that I don't want you to know about. It's that I have such deep, intimate, intimate interactions relationally that it's none of your business. I have an intimate conversation with my God. It's a secret prayer. Nothing wrong was said, but it's none of your business. It's my secret prayer. I think that we need to have secrets in our faith journey. Meaning that I would encourage each of you to ask God for something, maybe a development of something in your life, or pray about something and don't tell anyone. And when he answers, don't tell anyone. Just keep it and begin to develop a personal, hidden conversation with God that's just for the two of you. Because you are who you are in secret. Develop that kind of conversation, that secret prayer. Hannah was doing this in 1 Samuel 2. She wanted something very badly. She wanted a son. So she went to a place to pray. And she didn't know anybody was listening, but it says this. Hannah was praying in her heart. And her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Do you pray that way? Try secret praying. Let me give you a definition of secret praying. Secret prayer is the intimacy of our heart whispering with the Father. Feel free to secret pray. Here's another one. Constant prayer. Everybody, I'm going to read something from my one of my favorite authors, Thomas Merton. While I'm doing that, everybody, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.17. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Constant prayer is this process of never, st- I'm just constantly in a, in a dialogue, like a running. And Thomas Merton, who's one of my f- favorite authors, writes about going on these prayer walks where he would just walk through the woods and he would just notice everything and he's just thanking God for this and there's like this blending mesh between God's creation and God's presence and he's seeing it and like, thanks, oh, great job. And he's just talking to God almost like a little child and he writes this. The pale flowers of the dogwood outside this window are saints. The little yellow flowers that nobody notices on the edge of the road are saints looking up into the face of God. Isn't that beautiful? That's the way he's interacting with the world, just kind of grabbing what he's experiencing and grabbing God and saying, oh, we're all here together. What does your 1 Thessalonians 5.17 say? I want, we have lots of translations in the room, so I want to hear different ones. Pray continually. What was that one? First Thessalonians. Hmm. Pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Pray constantly. Every, without ceasing. Everybody got First Thessalonians five seventeen memorized. Great. You memorized some Bible at church today. Constant prayer is prayer without ceasing. How is that possible? All right, I got a Notre Dame illustration. (laughs) Uh, So like 10 years ago, I took Maddox to see Notre Dame and Stanford, and it was awesome. And I promised each of the children that at one point, go one-on-one, just the two of us, to see a Notre Dame game. Sophie, we're going. Now, I know something. It's five hours away. So Sophie and I are going to be in the car five and a half hours, and we're going to Notre Dame Stanford. I want to tell you, uh, with all of the love and admiration in my heart for who my daughter Sophie is as a person, I'm not wondering if we're going to be able to find things to talk about we will have a constant conversation from the moment we get in the car to the moment we're there. Sophie has a lot of ideas and a lot of things to say, and that's one of my favorite things about her, constant. I talk with her like this because I love her, 
and it's just a running dialogue. Do you just chat with God? Do you feel like all your prayers have to be King James prayers? Or can you just like, man, God, they made a good, that's a good sidewalk they put in here. Good job, guys. Can you just chat with God? Like just about stuff? I think there's these little hidden moments in Scripture where it's proof that there was just a running dialogue. Because Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, he's standing before the king. And the king can see that he, in his face that he's unhappy about something but doesn't know what. And so the king says, uh, what's wrong? What do you need? And it says in that moment that Nehemiah prayed to the Lord in heaven. Nehemiah 2, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. Do you think in that moment, like he's not even supposed to show the king that he's upset. Do you think that he told the king, good question, hang tight. I have to go and pray for a little bit and then I'm going to come back and answer you. Can you give me like five to ten minutes? No. Written into scripture is a little hidden constant prayer. He's just praying all the time. So some of your prayers may feel like King James prayers. Some of them might be written and formal. Some of them might be here and you remember that prayer. Some of them could be me and, and my daughter just chatting for five hours on the way to a Notre Dame game. Thomas Merton just going for a walk in the woods and saying, man, look at, good job, God. Flowers are awesome. It could just be talking. Constant prayer is the stream of thought in recognition of God's constant presence. What about upset prayer? Secret prayer, constant prayer, upset prayer. Psalm 18 reads like this. The ropes of death were almost wrapped around me. A destroying flood swept over me. The ropes of the grave were tied around me. Death set its trap in front of me. When I was in trouble... I called out to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry for help reached his ears. Sometimes when I'm meeting with one of you pastorally and you're going through something hard, the first question I ask is, have you told God how mad you are? Have you vented to God? Have you just unloaded you know, you can't unload really to any human like you can unload to God. Because when you unload to a human, even if you're paying that human to counsel you, you still have some kind of concern that they're not going to know how to take it. So you pull it back. You can upset pray to God as much as you want. You know why? Because you are not providing him new information. He already knows how upset you are. This is not about you telling him something he doesn't know. It's about you recognizing that he already knows it and joining with him vulnerably. It's about saying, I'm willing to be totally honest about what you already know. Are you telling God the truth? Jonah. Jonah 4. Jonah was very upset. He became angry. Now, just in case you don't remember the story, Jonah was wrong to be upset. Jonah's not a very cool person in this story. God wanted to send Jonah to give a revival to these people, and Jonah doesn't like them. So he decides not to go, and God says, how about a whale? So he goes, swallows up by a whale. The whale vomits him out. And then finally he says, okay, I'll be obedient. Congratulations, Jonah. So now he goes over to these people, and he does his religious duty and tells them the thing. And then he goes up and sits on a hill and says, well, I hope that doesn't work. And it did work. And so this is the upset prayer. Not only is Jonah allowed to pray this way, Jonah is wrong in every way. He is holding things against these people that he shouldn't hold. He's angry for wrong reasons, and he's still allowed to pray like this. 
he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, isn't this exactly what, I'm, I'm adding the tone, but I'm almost confident this is how he prayed it. Lord, isn't this exactly what I thought would happen when I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to run away to Tarshish. I knew that you're gracious. You are tender and kind. You are slow to get angry and full of love. You're a God who takes pity on people. You don't want to destroy them. Lord, take my life away. I'd rather die than live. But the Lord replied. God listened to him. Rotten prayer, wrong prayer, bad attitude. He's mad and God still listened. Is there something you can't say? You don't even need to be right. If you're mad, just pray. God listens when you're mad and wrong. Just pray. You don't need, if you think, well, I'm so angry, I just don't know if I understand totally and I just don't know if I can take this to God because what if I didn't understand? I did. Well, just tell him. He already knows what you're saying right now. Just pray it to him. I'm mad. I don't know what happened. It doesn't seem fair. I don't even know if the thing I just said is right, but I'm just angry. That's prayer. Upset prayer is an honest word of pain toward a present and powerful God of grace. Secret prayer, constant prayer, upset prayer. How about a noisy prayer? <laughs> noisy prayer. Says they all came together regularly, regularly to pray. The women joined them too. So did Jesus, Mother, uh, Mother Mary, and his brothers. People gathering together, they're all praying. Sometimes they even think they're drunk. They're praying so crazy. Jade was invited to speak at an Anglican church in Mobile, Alabama. And we went down there and we added on a couple days in Pensacola. That was awesome. But when she was speaking at the church, we, got, uh, we were asked to go there early. And then they had a room where all of the people who had been invited came. And they filled the whole room. And the pastor said, let's pray. And everyone prayed at the same time. Oh, wow. We've tried to do some of that here. Wesleyans get a little awkward. <laughs> We, yeah, let's keep doing it. We need some noisy prayer. Where I'm, if we all pray at the same volume, it's like I'm teaching you how to do it. We, we all pray at the same volume and it's less awkward. If, if some of us are louder, the, just, it's, no, it's supposed to be noisy and clangy and it's just a bunch of people all together and we're all praying at the same time. Matthew 18 says, when two or three are gathered together. James 5 says, pray together over the six, over the sick. Acts 12 says, many gathering together to pray. It doesn't say that they got together. We need to gather together. But then first, someone needs to pull out a piece of paper and we need to share our prayer requests. It doesn't say that. I don't see anybody sharing prayer requests in the Bible, actually. I just see people getting, ready, get, getting together to pray. I love the idea of a group of people coming together and someone says, let's pray, and everybody starts praying. If I hear... Because I hear you tell God that you had a terrible week. That's not bad. You don't need to tell me first that you had a terrible week so that I know that now we need to pray about your terrible week. I can learn about your terrible week because I hear you out loud tell God about your terrible week. And I said, oh, I didn't know they had a terrible week. Yeah, Lord, I agree. I want you to have a better week next week. Lord, she didn't have, I just heard she had a bad week. Help her to have a good week. Noisy, noisy, noisy. Noisy prayer is the buzz and hum of God's collected people united in heart and voice. We don't always have to like organize it like a service. Sometimes the people can just start talking. What about stumbling prayer? You're, you're going to love this. Romans 8. In the same way, the Holy Spirit helps us when we are weak. We don't know what to pray for. But the Spirit himself prays for us. He prays with groans too deep for words. For that reason, I know, Lenore, that you were praying in the dark time. Because even when you didn't know what to say, the Holy Spirit was saying it for you. God who looks into our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. And the Spirit prays for God's people just as God wants him to pray. Thanks, God for making me say what I was trying to say. I was always come back to the story of a man whose wife had been diagnosed with cancer for the third time 
She'd won twice. He's sitting in the hospital again. The doctor comes back in and says, I'm sorry, it's cancer. And he sits in the hallway, and his prayer is this. Lord, how should I be praying now? You don't need to know what to say. I remember Luann, she'd been a Christian for about a week, sitting in the car, family can't choose a restaurant. She said, I don't know how to pray, but I'm going to. You don't need to know how to pray. The feeling, the very movement of the heart of just saying, I acknowledge there is a God and there's some, something, something, I don't, know, I don't even have words for it. That's prayer. Psalm 38, 9. I'm going to encourage you to write this down. For some of you, this is your new favorite verse for a season. All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My, listen to this, my sighing is not hidden from you. Woo! All my longings lie open before you, Psalm 38, 9. My sighing is not hidden from you. When you've had a long day and you go to the grocery store and something happens and they don't have the ingredient you've been looking for, oh, that's not hidden. That could have been a prayer right there. Prayer is not about organizing certain thoughts, and I'm not lowering prayer down to this thing that anything is prayer. Sincerity, remember that. When we walk in faith and we sincerely try to live a life of constant dialogue with God, a mere sigh over the ingredient that's not there is prayer. God hears the sigh. Stumbling prayer is the wobbly child within grasping for the strong arms of a father. Now, there's five, but there are others. There's infinite others. Maddox and Ezra and I were sitting in the car going for a drive, and none of us said a word. It was just quiet. We were just enjoying each other. We didn't talk. How do I know that's the kind of prayer? Because prayer is relational. And if I can think of a place in my life where this kind of dialogue happens, that's another kind of prayer. Josh, when I talk with you, we have lots of what if prayers. Josh and I, something in our dynamic, we're always like, I wonder if, you know, you know what would be cool? That's a kind of prayer now. I can talk to God like that. You know what would be cool, God? Because I know that it's a normal dialogue because of a relationship that I have. It helps to teach me that maybe I could also talk to God that way. When I talk to Jason, it's about leadership. Jason Hayes, when I talk to him, it's about leadership thing. You know what we really should think about is, and we're trying to project forward and cast vision and get in front of something. Because I talk to my friend Jason that way, who's the chair of our board, now I realize, oh, that's a normal relationship conversation style. It's the way, I bet I could talk to God like that. I'm gonna close with what our prayers do. The reason that this is a little bit of a different sermon on prayer than I've ever heard is because I typically, when I hear or read a book about prayer, or hear a sermon about prayer, people talking about prayer, it focuses on two things. You need to do it, like it's some sort of like you should pray more, and what it can do. And what I want to focus on mostly is to live a life of constant prayer because your sincere heart, your faith has connected you with God in all moments. And so everything that's happening in your mind, there's always this feeling of prayer, but I don't want to ignore what it does. I wasn't gonna, <laughs> all right. It shapes us, equips us, and engages us. I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on each of those. I work really hard on getting this S-E-E. -E. Prayer helps us to see. I, I had, even this morning it was S-E-A, I had it as it aligns us and I was sitting on the porch like, yeah, that doesn't work. C, maybe like life is a C and prayer helps us to get across the C. That's not going to get me good grades in my preaching class. C, S-E-E, -E, it shapes us, it equips us, it engages us. How does it shape us? When you spend time with someone, the qualities of that person impact who you're becoming. You can grow in your faith and in your Christ-likeness by being a part of us, but you're not going to go very far if you don't speak with them. Prayer shapes you into the person you're speaking with. So you can tell when someone is living a prayerful life 
because they are becoming Christ-like. Prayer shapes us because we become like the people we spend time with. Prayer helps to shape us into godliness. It equips us. I love, I, this is not the exact quote, but it's something like, I have so much to do today, I must begin with prayer. Prayer equips you for what is, whatever is going to happen. You don't know what is going to happen today. I've talked with some of you who have stumbled across this idea of beginning your day with prayer and watching the day work out. Walking into your day without opening the day with prayer is a great way to not be equipped for whatever the day might swing at you. So prayer shapes you into Christ-likeness. It equips you for whatever you may have that day, and it, and it engages you. God did not go to sleep that night, and he's not going to go to sleep tomorrow night. God is in constant activity. There is a kingdom plan that is, being, uh, that is happening around you, and prayer engages you in that plan. It helps to make sure that all of your decisions, your thoughts, your movements, and all the things that are happening in your life are best, you're best aligned and best fitting into the kingdom model, whatever God is doing. When we pray like this, we're saying, make me a part of a bigger plan. I want to want like God wants. We're closing with communion. And there are a lot of different ways to do communion. Uh, and I asked that we close after communion with a song that's up. Sometimes we do communion like, uh, like it's a, a viewing or a funeral or something like that. Communion is your life source. Communion is exciting. If you have had a tough week, if you feel empty, like the tank's running on empty, if you feel like you got run over and you're exhausted and you don't, this is the best possible scenario here. This is communion. This is the reminder that he is your life. During this time of communion, I want to encourage you to think through what we have talked about. Don't necessarily pick one of these kinds of prayers. Pick your own. How do you want to talk to God today? How do you want to talk to him? Now, the one that I didn't really highlight much was listening. <laughs> Make sure and keep it a dialogue. Sometimes our prayers need to just be listening. But let's go into this, type, this time of communion with an added attention to a dialogue with God. Be honest with him. If you had a hard week, tell God that you had a hard week and enjoy the life of Christ. If you had a great week, thank him for it and then enjoy the life of Christ. If you have questions, if you have relationship problems, if you have things in your life that need to be worked out, just tell them the truth. There are no right or wrong words. There's just words. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The way this is going to work, you'll be dismissed from the back rows forward. Choose one of these aisles, come up to where whichever one is most convenient for you. And then we like to try to make sure that no one takes communion by themselves. That's a bit of an oxymoron. Communion is a collection. It is a community event. We are communing not only ourselves with God, we're communing, communing one with one another. So make sure and be uh, hospitable to one another and invite. You can feel free to take a spot at an altar, take a spot in the corner, go back to your seat. Uh, but pray over one another and thank God for his body and his blood which are your life.